This is Professor Simon's history classroom, and this week he is not here, so I am filling in for him. Who am I? I am Alexander the Great, the greatest conqueror in history. I'm famous for my blonde hair, as you see. Anyway, Professor Simon is moving on to talk about the ancient Greeks. He'll first talk about the Minoans and the Mycenaeans, which was part of the Greek Bronze Age, and then he's also going to talk about the rise of the city-states, like Athens, which is, by the way, my favorite city-state, and then also Sparta. He also talk about Homer, the greatest poet in the world. You know, like the Iliad, which you see behind me, and that particular, that, that poem, man, that epic, it just, it just makes me feel so great, you know, as a warrior, you know, conquering just like Achilles. So anyway, I just wanted to tell you about what he's doing this week, and I have to go. I've got to go conquer Persia, so I'll see you later. So have a good, good week, by the way. Like I said, this week, uh, my new focus will be on the Greeks. We'll get to ancient Greece. Uh, you know, the Western culture kind of comes in at this point. Uh, mostly today, I'll, I'll, of course, focus on what they call the Aegean civilization, uh, which mostly deals with like the Minoan and the Mycenaean cultures. It's also known as sometimes the Greek Bronze Age. Uh, it's nicknamed. Uh, so you can see behind me right there, we've got the Acropolis with the famous Parthenon, one of the greatest architectural buildings ever constructed uh, in the world. I think right now the Greeks are trying to reconstruct part of it uh, as of now, which I think is kind of controversial, but uh, it'll be interesting to see what they do with that uh, when they do finish it. So yeah, the famous, famous uh, Acropolis, of course, behind me. All right, so uh, like I said, we're gonna talk about today, uh, of course, ancient Greece, uh, which Greece goes back you know, thousands of years. It's not as old as the River Valley civilizations, which I told you go back you know, thousands of years, back to close to about the beginning of the uh, Bronze Age. Uh, but ancient Greece is important. It is, you know, if you know about this, the first major European civilization. It's also where, you know, the birthplace of Western culture, Western civilization. So a lot of cultures in the West, you know, are highly, you know, influenced by it. Uh, you know, like Roman, the Romans later that come in, like the Roman Empire uh, was heavily influenced uh, by, by Greek culture. A lot of Western Europe was. A lot of the West, like America, like United States and other countries in the West, European countries, modern European countries today are highly, you know, influenced by, of course, ancient Greece. The reason why is because, you know, Greece is the birthplace of things like democracy, because we know of uh, philosophy, uh, history, architecture, uh, even di different hist artistic ideas uh, like plays, like the play. Uh, it's a good example, a lot of poetry, things like that. Uh, even early scientific ideas, they think, started with the Greeks uh, a long time ago. So, so I'll kind of get into like some of the early background of, of Greek, Greek culture. Uh, and um, here's kind of a map showing you ancient, uh, the area of where ancient Greece was uh, a long time ago. Uh, most of ancient Greece is like in the southeastern part of Europe. And that would be about the location of where it is, kind of located between like where Turkey is and Italy. That'd be kind of the region about where it is uh, in southern Europe. Uh, and um, it's kind of situated really around the Aegean Sea, the Aegean Basin. It's about where a majority of most of the Greek people lived, uh, although uh, some did live like around the Black Sea, uh, close to Italy, like around where southern Italy uh, and also uh, Sicily. And then some Greeks even spread westward, like towards Spain at one point. Uh, and uh, I think it was the famous uh, Greek philosopher Plato once said that the Greeks settled around the Aegean like frogs around a pond. Uh, and um, you can see all the different regions of, of Greece I'll get to later. But you got Crete on the bottom. Uh, you see there, uh, I'll get to that later. That's where the Minoans uh, kind of begin uh, as a culture in the Bronze Age. 
I'll get to the Mycenaean culture, but the Mycenaean culture kind of flourishes in the southern part of Greece. Uh, you have like that peninsula on the bottom I'll get to later called the Peloponnesus. Uh, that's there. Uh, but Sparta, Argos, Corinth will kind of emerge out of there later. Athens, Thebes above that, Delphi, all those areas uh, are areas that uh, kind of start in Greece a long time ago. Like Athens is in the Attica Peninsula, Thebes and Delphi are in an area called Boeotia. Uh, and then you get up into where Mount Olympus is, uh, Thesley, I think is the area they call it sometimes uh, as well. Mount Olympus, of course, the tallest mountain uh, in Greece, um, which I think it's something like 9,500 feet tall. Uh, and then, of course, Macedonia in the north, uh, where we have Alexander the Great that emerges uh, around the 4th century. Thrace, you see up in the northern part of Greece, in the northern Aegean basin right there. Uh, Western Turkey, you've got a lot of Greeks there uh, as well. Uh, and then don't forget the islands, all the islands. There's like probably hundreds of thousands of islands throughout the Aegean. You have Greeks also living there uh, a as well. So it's got to kind of give you an idea, perspective of, you know, where all the different Greek peoples live uh, throughout the gene. Kind of like a Plato saying like frogs around a pond is kind of basically, I guess, what he said about that. Uh, they talk about sometimes uh, another thing, too, like where the term Europe came from. Uh, supposedly Europa, if you know about her, uh, she was this um, Phoenician princess that supposedly where the word Europe came from like a long time ago. And uh, in, in Greek mythology, there was a story where uh, she was this princess of Phoenicia, like where Lebanon is a long time ago, uh, ancient Phoenicia. Uh, and uh, she was kidnapped by the god Zeus, uh, who disguised himself as a bull and brought her to Crete, uh, where uh, she uh, gave birth to a couple sons, which one of them was King Minos, if you know about that, uh, who was one of the kings of the, supposedly of the Minoans later. Uh, and so the word the word Europe kind of emerged from from her name, uh, and so I guess some people kind of view her as like almost like the mother of Europe, and where the kind of name uh, came from over time. So it's kind of the story of, of you know where that came from. And I think Europa ends up being, if you know about that, uh, one of the moons uh, of Jupiter. Uh, I think named by Galile Galileo later, uh, more closer to modern times. Now, of course, the main thing I'm going to get to today, I'm going to talk about the Greek Bronze Age, uh, which uh, is kind of a pivotal early period in uh, Greek history. It's predominantly a period uh, that goes back somewhere between two to 3,000 B.C. Uh, is about when it starts. Uh, it's got all kinds of names. They call it usually the Aegean Civilization because you've got all these different cultures that live in and around the Aegean, like the Minoan culture, uh, the Mycenaean culture. Uh, and um, they also call it the Hellenic period uh, as well. Uh, and so I think it usually starts maybe around 3000 BC at the most, and then it goes down to close to about maybe 1200 BC uh, or the 12th century BC would be the time period. So the first thing I'm going to focus on, of course, with the uh, period of the Aegean civilizations. I want to talk about the Minoans first, that particular culture, uh, which you see right here. And uh, the Minoans uh, were a uh, considered one of the first major civilizations that emerges in Europe uh, at the time in the Bronze Age. Uh, if you know about the Minoans, uh, they were mostly a maritime culture that was dominant throughout the Aegean and part of the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. And it's considered like the first link uh, in a lot of the future European civilizations that'll come along like the Greeks uh, and the Romans. You can see they started somewhere like 5,000 years ago, was believed to be, be the time period of when the Minoans existed uh, as a culture. And uh, they were actually famous for being a pretty good maritime culture that traded throughout extensively with like Egypt, Cyprus, uh, also, they think maybe part of Turkey, Canaan, uh, and other areas, and they think they influenced people like the Greeks, uh, probably the probably the Phoenicians later, uh, to kind of you know do sea trade you know throughout that region 
uh, of, of, of that period a long time ago. Uh, you can see images on the right, I'll get to it later, uh, but they're famous for cities they build on Crete, like Canossus, uh, which Canossus was considered to be one of the first probably European cities ever, ever built, uh, which dates back, I think, maybe 4,000 years ago or older. Now, I do have other, other images I'll kind of share with you. I'll get to later King Minos is famous, but uh, here's kind of an image, of course, showing the Aegean. So, yeah, they, they mostly traded probably within the Aegean Basin and probably the eastern part of the Mediterranean because uh, they, have, they have found Minoan artifacts as far east as you know, getting close to where, where Turkey and Israel is, and of course, especially, and they found a lot of artifacts from them uh, in also uh, what is uh, Egypt uh, today. Uh, this man on the left you're seeing here, Sir Arthur Evans, he's, he's a pretty important figure, of course, with early Minoan culture uh, on, on the island of Crete. Uh, if you know about him, Evans was this British archaeologist that came to Crete uh, in the 1890s, uh, he actually knew another archaeologist named Heinrich Schliemann, who I'll talk about, who was more connected to like the Mycenaean culture in, in Troy. Uh, and he was told to go there because uh, he might find evidence of the Mycenaeans. And so he went to Crete. But if you know what happened, he found some unique culture that was different from Mycenaean. Uh, and he bought some land there where Canossus is, and he began trying to excavate it. And over time, it was, if you know about it, it was actually reconstructed, uh, the actual city uh, itself that you're looking at images uh, on the right. So you can see that area where Canossus is. And Canossus uh, is an area that's about, they think, I want to say about three acres in size. And they think the palace complex of Canossus went back at least 4,000 years ago. I think maybe 2000 BC, if maybe when some of the first palace complexes were built there uh, on Crete, uh, they think it was also a city. So it's like a city and palace complex uh, where close to 15, 20,000 people may have lived there at one point. And it was known for having a lot of rooms. I think they estimated that Canas had something like 1,300 rooms uh, actually within it, but they're not sure who built it. Some say King Minos, but they don't really know who constructed it over time, like kings. Uh, but it was probably built over many, many centuries in its construction. Uh, here's other images of it. So, yeah, you can see it's actually a, probably a palace complex that was constructed over time where they added buildings. And it does have a, a main courtyard, central court uh, that's in the middle, uh, which is about 90 by 160 feet uh, in size. And you can see it's got a lot of public buildings that are basically around it. And um, there is one section on the left that's the most famous part of it, which is the so-called throne room, uh, where some archaeologists theorize that that may have been the room where the kings of, you know, the Minoans may have, you know, sat. Uh, although it's kind of been debated about whether it was kings that sat there or some kind of religious priestess, maybe, has also been speculated uh, as well. Uh, but you can see on the right on that image, uh, they began later, probably early 20th century, reconstructing it of maybe what it looked like. Uh, here's kind of the interior where the throne room is right there. Uh, so you see, I'll get to it later, but Minoans were very famous for a lot of fresco paintings uh, that they painted on their, you know, homes and palaces and things like that. Uh, some they're very, not, very well famous for, of course, one of the first cultures to uh, do that. Here's other images. Some, of course, they've rebuilt as well, but you can see how they have columns, which, you know, columns is something you see also like in the Egyptian world on uh, things like that. And so uh, use of columns may have been constructed in the architecture of Canas to hold up some of the buildings uh, in general. Uh, now, one of the stories I did want to talk about that's very famous, of course, is the story of the Minotaur. Uh, if you know about this story, it's often associated with, of course, King Minos. And if you know about this, uh, when Evans went to Crete, 
and he began excavating uh, that city of Canossus, uh, he decided to call the people of Crete in ancient times, he called them Minoan. So Minoan uh, was a term he coined uh, named after King Minos, uh, who, by the way, was, a, they think, a mythological ruler of Crete, according to the Greeks. Uh, they're not sure when he lived. They're not even sure if he was a real person or not. So that's still you know, hotly debated about, about that. But it is considered one of the most famous stories uh, ever told uh, that is associated with ancient you know, Crete a uh, long time ago. And uh, it's associated with this uh, legend, you know, that where there was this so-called bull creature that uh, is told by the Roman poet Ovid. He was writing this uh, in a series of, of you may have heard the, the book called Metamorphosis, uh, written about the first century CE, where he describes the story uh, in, of the Minotaur, which Minotaur, by the way, means uh, in, um, I guess in Greek, uh, it means bull of Minos uh, is what it means. And if you know about it, it was this mythical creature that was half bull, half man. Uh, and uh, it was eventually put into this labyrinth where it was a meat eater. Uh, they gave you know human sacrifices to it uh, to be eaten. And supposedly uh, in this um, labyrinth, which was part of King Minos's palace complex, uh, it was built by this famous uh, architect. Uh, named, uh, I think his name was Daedalus, uh, and uh, people that went into the labyrinth couldn't get out of it. It was like a maze, uh, and of course the manager would catch them and eat them, uh, basically. Uh, what was the deal with the story? Like, what was the origins of it? Well, according to the Greeks, uh, what happened uh, was one of the sons of King Minos had died uh, in one of the Greek games at Athens, and so in punishment, uh, they had to basically send sacrifices uh, to this uh, monster, the Minotaur, to be eaten alive. Uh, I think what it was, they had to send like something like seven boys and seven girls every seven or nine years. I think it varies with how many years it was, basically. Uh, and uh, supposedly the offspring of the Minotaur, like how it got born, if you know about it, uh, there was a story where uh, the Greeks told that... Um, it was supposed to be a story where King Minos had this white bull he was supposed to sacrifice to the god Poseidon, but he wanted to keep it for himself. And so Poseidon got angry and had uh, King Minos' wife, Pasiphae, have sex with a bull. Uh, and so the offspring was this monster, uh, the Minotaur, which they put later, of course, in this uh, labyrinth. Uh, of course, also Theseus, you may have heard of him. Uh, he was supposedly in Greek mythology, the actual hero uh, that came to Crete uh, and killed uh, the Minotaur. Theseus was actually the son of the king of Athens who came as one of, I guess, the sacrifices or disguised as one of the sacrifices and was able to go into the maze and kill it. So now whether it's really a true story, they don't really know. Uh, I think they speculate that it's likely a story that the Greeks made up about the Cretans, Minoan peoples, because they were the dominant culture uh, of the region, and they were having to pay tribute to them. And so maybe they were also saying that the Minoans were savage, and you know the Greeks were more civilized, you know, in comparison. But they actually think that the Minoans were pretty civilized uh, as a, as an actual culture. So that's the story, of course, of the famous Minotaur. But they do think that bulls are a part of of Minoan culture. It's, you know, used a lot with, they think, probably religion, most likely. Now, whether they worship bulls as gods, I don't know. Uh, but uh, they do know it was part of games. I'll get to it later. But the Minoans had this thing called the bull jumping or bull leaping, where they would jump over the backs of bulls. Uh, so they were kind of kept as pets, almost, uh, in a sense. So maybe they kind of uh, worship them or maybe sacrifice them to their gods. Uh, of course, the thing I'll get to next and talk about is Minoan frescoes. Uh, frescoes is something that, you know, they're very famous for, uh, which they put a lot, you know, in their actual homes. They find them, of course, in a lot of their palaces. And uh, these were considered some of the earliest type of mural paintings that were done, uh, which were a form of uh, use of plaster, or what we call wet lime plaster, uh, which wet lime plaster 
is a mixture of like several things like limestone or chalk uh, and then also sand and water, uh, which uh, the main material, I guess, if you want to know uh, that's used is calcium hydroxide. That's mostly the main thing that's in chemicals or whatever minerals that are in limestone. Uh, and that's primarily what was used to, of course, uh, make a lot of these paintings a long time ago in the ancient world. Uh, here are examples right here. This one right here, the famous bull leaping fresco, is considered to be one of the most famous uh, frescoes ever done uh, by the Minoans. Uh, it was originally found uh, in the Palace of Canossus uh, by Evans, uh, which they think it might date back to the 15th century BC. That's kind of debated uh, today, but uh, it is famous for uh, depicting what they think was some kind of acrobatic sport uh, that was part of the Minoan world where contestants would jump over the back of the bull. I think they think that they would actually grab the bull by the horns and then jump over the back of the bull and jump off. I don't know how they grab the bull by the horns. <laughs> I wouldn't want to try that. Uh, but uh, that's something that supposedly was part of the Minoans. And I guess they, in that great courtyard, they may have put on these events, which may have been part of annual festivals that they had. And it does kind of remind you of like later uh, what we call bullfighting, which is, you know, kind of common in the modern world uh, today. They do have similar things today where they have bull leaping, where people jump over bulls and things like that. They're still doing that in Spain and other countries. I think in India, too, they do something like that uh, as well. Uh, and so it's something that's obviously part of, you know, back then and today still. Uh, so here's kind of another image shown kind of without that image at the top. But uh, there's other images, of course, like uh, in also Canas, they found the famous fresco painting of the Blue Dolphins uh, as well. That's well, and I think that's also another famous one that was depicted too. Uh, that I guess Evans found uh, as well there. Uh, other other ones here I've got. Uh, of course, top left I was showing you uh, the what I guess are Minoan women. Uh, you know, at the time, how they dressed, uh, maybe how their hairstyles were and things like that. And uh, you'll notice that a lot of the men and women do not wear a lot of clothes, especially they go topless a lot. Even the women, like, expose their breasts. Uh, that's something you don't see a lot of uh, in European culture later. Uh, it's also a very warm climate, you know, in that part of the Aegean. Uh, and so... Um, they're not sure what those images, like the woman that's on the bottom next with those men, uh, she may have been some kind of Minoan priestess of some type, they think. They're not sure who the man is in the middle, though. I think either a Minoan priest or a Minoan prince, maybe, of some type. Uh, do you know on the right, you've got these two boys that are boxing, they think, because uh, they think that the Minoans were the ones that invented like early forms of boxing, Blood sports like Greco-Roman wrestling uh, were kind of invented uh, by them. And you can see even like, obviously monkeys, they find like in like Canossus, uh, monkey, paintings of monkeys on the walls. So that's obvious indication of them having some contact with parts of Africa, like trading down there on uh, things like that. Oh, another thing that's famous too that um, Evans found at Canossus, like around 1903, uh, was the so-called Minoan snake goddess um, figurines, uh, which there's been a lot of debate about what that was uh, connected to. Some people think that it may have been connected to some kind of Minoan religion uh, or cults, like maybe a snake goddess of some type, uh, but they're not sure what that is exactly. Uh, it, does have, it almost seems like connections to like Egypt, maybe, because, you know, Egypt has the goddess Isis, if you know about that, and Isis is often connected with uh, what is um, snakes as well. And Isis, you know, is a fertility goddess, and so could be it's a fertility goddess of some type, you know, associated with Minoan culture, but they're not sure exactly what, what that was, but he found that too, which is quite interesting. Uh, of course, the big thing that, uh, if you know about Evans, Evans uh, was also the one that was one of the first to discover uh, the Minoan language, uh, which is called Linear A. Uh, and 
Uh, linear A uh, is a type of, uh, they think, pre-Greek language that they think dates back to like the 18th century BC. It may have been used for like a few hundred years, and it was predominantly written on clay tablets, uh, which some were carved in and some were even stamped uh, as well. It used about 80 to 90 symbols uh, in the actual language, which they think it's still undecipherable, although there's been some speculation, I think, in the last couple of years that they may have cracked it, may have cracked the language and all that. But they found up to 1,400 inscriptions of these of this various language uh, that was used. Uh, and uh, there is one that's very famous, which is in the middle, called the Phaistos disc, which was found at one of their palaces called Phaistos, a city that's kind of south of uh, Heraclea and, and um, also uh, Canossus. And it's actually this um, six-inch wide clay tablet they discovered where it has uh, stamped um, language on it of the, of the Phoenician, of the actual, um, excuse me, the Minoan language. But they're not sure what what it is, uh, so it's kind of a debate about what it says and uh, what it actually could be. Could actually be the actual language itself, like the alphabet or whatever, uh, on it, uh, stamped out. Uh, but they're really unsure about it. But they do think that Linear A uh, is an early language of like later languages that we have in in Greece, like Linear B used by the Mycenaeans, and then you get Old Greek that comes in later, uh, which probably was influenced by the Phoenicians uh, as, as well. Uh, of course, also the Minoans were very famous for pottery. Uh, of course, they used pottery uh, to store like wine, uh, olive oil, uh, which they think they may have exported uh, from Crete uh, in the Aegean uh, to other states, like maybe Egypt, uh, et cetera. Uh, and they also produced like a lot of wool as well. So a lot of the Greeks later, you know, were big into olive oil, wine production, uh, et cetera. Now, the one thing I did want to talk about, too, also about the Medoans, uh, their culture uh, declined rapidly, which they think it uh, may have, they think they may have been conquered at one point by the Mycenaeans later, but they do think there was some kind of cataclysmic event that led to their demise, which they think a lot of it had to do with this uh, volcanic eruption that occurred in the southern Aegean, uh, called either the Fair Eruption or it's sometimes called the uh, Minoan Eruption uh, as well. And it was a volcanic eruption that occurred either in the 17th or 16th century BC. They're not sure the exact time period of when it took place, uh, but they do know where it was. It happened where the island of Santorini is, uh, which is in the southern Aegean. Uh, and I think I've got some uh, other images shown right here, a map of the southern Aegean, which is right above Crete. Uh, and um, Santorini is on the bottom of an area that they call the Cyclades. Cyclades uh, is a series of islands that are kind of between Turkey uh, and mainland Greece. Uh, and... Um, Santorini has different names. Uh, Thera uh, is a common name, uh, which uh, I think that was a name later the Greeks called it. Uh, and then Caliste, I believe, might be like an Egyptian name uh, that it was also called uh, as well. And uh, Santorini, that area was very important because the Minoans, they think, had their main uh, fleet there. Uh, and there was a port there called Acrotiri. Uh, was the I guess the nickname uh, it was called, uh, and um, there's kind of images of Santorini, of course, with this famous white house with the blue domes on it. Santorini is a very popular site, by the way. People like to go see a lot of a lot of tourist ships stop there, of course, uh, in in the Aegean, uh, and. Um, uh, if you know about the actual uh, site of Akrotiri, um, it was actually discovered by this man named Spyrodon Marinatis, who found it uh, in the 1960s. And as this volcanic eruption happened on Santorini, it buried the main port city there, like buried a volcanic ash 
Uh, and so in the 1960s, he began to kind of uh, uncover it and excavate it. And so they found this buried town uh, that was there. Uh, that's now like an archaeological site that you can tour uh, on, on the island of Santorini. And um, they think that the, the Minoans were for, those that I guess survived were forced to flee uh, when this eruption, of course, occurred. And so here got images showing, I think, what was kind of some kind of fresco painting showing the actual city that was there. And, of course, the ships that were based there uh, also uh, with the port uh, as well. But, yeah, the whole thing was buried. Uh, and um, they think that what happened was, uh, besides, you know, destroying the town of Akrotiri and Santorini, blowing it up, basically, uh, it also sent tsunamis that hit basically Crete. And they think Crete was wiped out uh, because of this volcanic eruption uh, that occurred. And uh, some people think that the decline of the Minoans has often been connected to, of course, the story of Plato's Atlantis, uh, where uh, the famous Greek philosopher in the fourth, fourth century told of a story of the so-called fictional island and civilization that was supposed to be very advanced, like more advanced than the Greeks were like a long time ago. And uh, according to Plato, uh, Atlantis existed something like almost a thousand years uh, before they did, and it disappeared into the sea. Well, there was some kind of like, I think it was almost like a volcanic eruption that happened or something like that. Uh, and so for years, people thought that there was some kind of connection between the story of Atlantis uh, and the Minoan culture, and they think that might, might be where the famous story came from, uh, from a long time ago. So that is an interesting connection with that. Although, if you know about the Greeks, the Greeks thought that the uh, Atlantis was actually to the west, like close to where the Atlantic Ocean is uh, and all that. Uh, but they probably thought that it was somewhere else and not in the same vicinity. So that's the... That's what happened, of course, with the Bedouins. They think that because of all that, the, they'll get to the mice, and the mice and Ians were able to come in uh, and eventually take over Crete. And they believe that the Bedouin culture was then absorbed into the mice and Ian culture. And that's the next thing I want to get into uh, and talk about today uh, is the mice and Ian culture. Uh, the mice and Ian culture was kind of a continuation of the Greek Bronze. It kind of happens in the, uh, the late Greek Bronze Age. Uh, we can see 16th to about the 12th centuries BC is about when it was. Uh, they mostly lived in the Greek mainland, but also uh, they inhabited Crete, uh, probably the Cyclades uh, as well. And uh, the Mycenaean culture was different from Minoan. The Minoans were more of a maritime, kind of a peaceful type culture, uh, as the, the uh, Mycenaeans were not. They were more warlike uh, as a culture, uh, and uh, they built similar cities to what the, Min the Minoans built, uh, but they built more like fortified cities uh, that were built on hilltops. Well, they call it Acropolis. They had also palace complexes like the Minoans did, but they built like walls around their cities, uh, and the Minoans did not. Uh, That's kind of one of the differences between the two, uh, two different cultures. Uh, they do think the Mycenaean culture probably absorbed a lot of the Bedouin culture. So they don't think the Mycenaean culture was an original culture. I think I've heard sometimes they call it kind of like a retrograde culture uh, that absorbed other ideas uh, from other people. And um, they are ruled by these warrior type kings I'll get to later, uh, which are called a Waynax. Uh, and uh, it'll be kings like Agamemnon. Uh, Manelaus, uh, Achilles, Odysseus, uh, kings you hear about uh, in the stories of Homer. So those are the kind of kings that you uh, really get to kind of know uh, from that time period. Uh, Evans uh, also coined the actual language of the Mycenaeans. Uh, it's later dubbed Linear B. Uh, so it's kind of believed to be some kind of pre-Greek writing system that kind of uh, surpassed Linear A. Uh, it may have been influenced uh, by Linear A, uh, but they do think it was one of these kind of early pre, 
uh, you know, in, Indo-European languages in that region that eventually led to later, the later Greek language, Old Greek, uh, which probably evolved from linear A, linear B, uh, and probably Phoenician influences. Now, I've got other images kind of right here uh, on the right, of course. Uh, so, yeah, they do think that Minoan culture was probably assimilated uh, into Mycenaean culture, they think at least by about 1400 uh, BC. So Crete was invaded, uh, and what was left of the Minoans was destroyed uh, by them. And you can see that the Mycenaeans became like the middlemen. Well, again, a lot of the trade throughout that region as well. They had different cities that were famous, Mycenae, Tyrans, they think Athens, Thebes, Pylos, and other cities, maybe even early Sparta, uh, may have kind of started uh, at that point uh, in time uh, during, the, during the Bronze Age. And they're not sure the actual name of the Mycenaean culture. I think I'll get to it later, but Homer says they're, they're called Achaean, uh, is the other name, uh, but their, their name is really unknown. Just like the Minoan culture, they don't know what they were called either. They're called Minoans or Cretans, of course, uh, sometimes in modern times. So yeah, uh, the Mycenaeans you see in this slide, yeah, they emerge, of course, in the Greek mainland and build these you know, palace complex uh, with these fortress type cities that are famous. Uh, and uh, because of the city of Mycenae, that's, that's part of why later they're called Mycenaeans because Mycenae uh, was considered the most powerful of these different, I guess, city-states that started emerging uh, throughout, uh, you know, Bronze Age Greece at the time. And it was located in the northeastern part of the Peloponnese or Peloponnesus Peninsula in what is now the southern part of the Republic of Greece. Uh, and um, you can see images, of course, on the right kind of depicting, uh, you know, the, the actual city of Mycenae, which I told you these cities were heavily fortified, of course, uh, in, in the Bronze Age. Uh, there's kind of an image of Linear B, by the way. Linear B, uh, I think, used up to 200 symbols or more, and it has been deciphered, at least as far as they know. They've been able to decipher a lot of the language. Uh, and so Linear B is kind of like the link uh, between uh, like early Greek civilizations uh, and, of course, the ones that will kind of come in the Iron Age uh, with Old Greek, like Ionic or Doric Greek uh, that comes later. They think that probably, I said, Phoenician, the Phoenician language probably had a big influence on how, how the Greek language evolved into it, what it is later. I think there's even a theory that part of why the Greeks developed a language was to write down Homer's epics and all that. Uh, here's kind of an image of what ancient Mycenae looked like a long time ago. So they think it might date back to the 16th century BC uh, when the city was founded a long time ago. So you can see it was a fortified city. It was built like a palace complex, you know, similar to what the Minoans were like Canossus uh, on Crete. Uh, but like I said, they don't think the Minoans had fortifications uh, as far as they know. And uh, the Mycenaeans are very famous for a lot of early Greek architecture. I'll get to it later, but the famous Lion Gate is probably the most famous thing associated with Mycenae. Uh, I'll get to the so-called Cyclopean masonry they used to build a lot of their buildings and walls. Uh, a lot of palace complex were constructed too uh, in that Greek Bronze Age. They also had a lot of elaborate tombs and graves that they found that were also found at that site and other sites in the region. Uh, here's kind of an aerial view, of course, of the ruins of Mycenae. So parts of it have been kind of rebuilt. And of course, uh, they think back in the 1800s, archaeologists first came there and started doing excavations uh, at that site. But they think people had known about Mycenae going back probably hundreds and hundreds of years. Here's other images, uh, which are right here, showing, of course, some of the walls uh, at Mycenae, 
Uh, and um, here's the most famous feature they always talk about, especially architectural feature uh, associated with uh, Mycenae, uh, which is the so-called Lion Gate uh, that's there. Uh, and uh, they think the Lion Gate is some type of main entrance. And I think that they think that Mycenae had two main entrances uh, into the city, uh, so-called Postern Gate. That one's not as important, but the Lion Gate, they think, may have been the main entrance uh, into it. And it is considered one of the first famous architectural feature you see in the Greek world. It's almost like an early type of arch. You see Greco-Roman arch uh, being built there. It has a coat of arms, which is at the top, which are these two lionesses uh, with a stone column uh, in the middle. Uh, and they're not sure what that could be. Maybe it's a coat of arms for the actual family uh, that ruled Mycenae. Uh, maybe the house of Atreus, uh, you know, King Atreus, who they think may have been one of the kings uh, that ruled there, uh, and his son Agamemnon uh, and Menelaus. Uh, later, uh, but um, the lion, the lion gate. Um, here's kind of another image uh, right here. Uh, you can see what's interesting about a lot of the architecture at Mycenae and other uh, similar sites. They tend to stack up a lot of their stone, uh, which they often call it Cyclopean walls or Cyclopean masonry, uh, and uh, what it is, it's, it's basically where they take stones and boulders and kind of stack it up uh, without using any lime mortar. So there's like no kind of like cement being used uh, between uh, the gaps uh, in walls. Uh, and uh, I think the joke was the one-eyed monster uh, Cyclops built it or something like that, giant. Uh, and so that's kind of where the name came from, which is right. Uh, you know, right there. So yeah, you can see more of a close-up view of the actual coat of arms with the two lions uh, right there with the, uh, I guess, ionic column that's, I guess a Doric column that's in the middle, actually. But um, other features, too. Here's kind of another image showing the Cyclopean masonry, by the way. So they have to really stack up these small boulders uh, or, or stones. Uh, you can see uh, with that. Here's another image showing out of the Cyclopean masonry uh, that they also used. I'm sure some of this has been kind of rebuilt uh, to wait, I guess, what it looked like. Now, they have this man that's very famous associated with Mycenae and later Troy, if you know about it, named Heinrich Schliemann. Schliemann uh, is a very important archaeologist uh, with Mycenae, and he's kind of considered like a pioneer uh, in Mycenaean uh, architecture. And uh, if you know about Schliemann, he's uh, German, uh, originally goes back to the 19th century. And uh, he was originally a businessman uh, who did a lot with like merchant stuff. And uh, he actually at one point came to the United States uh, and was involved in the California gold rush. So he was very wealthy, probably a millionaire uh, at the time. But Schliemann uh, was big into archeology. span uh, in fact, he was kind of self-learned, uh, and so he was this amateur archaeologist that was very interested uh, in the early Greek Bronze Age. Uh, and so he later went on to do a bunch of excavations at those three sites the most, uh, Mycenae, Troy, and Tyrens, which is in also in Greece. Uh, and that was done in the 1870s uh, when all this was going on. Uh, and uh, Schliemann, Schliemann um, believed uh, that the works of Homer, who wrote uh, the famous epics, the Iliad and the Odyssey, which talk about the Trojan War period uh, and what they think was Mycenaean uh, you know, history, um, he thought that the epics of Homer were actually real, like based on historical truths or historical events that actually happened uh, in uh, I think Schliemann, um, if you know about him, uh, he he was just a great lover of Homer. In fact, he, I think he had memorized both the Iliad and the Odyssey. He could actually recite both of them by heart from memory and in Greek, uh, by the way. I think he was one of these type of men that knew multiple languages, like many languages he could speak. Uh, and so he was a very, very intelligent man. 
but never college educated. He'd go to any kind of university or anything like like that. And so he was an amateur archaeologist. But he's kind of considered a pioneer uh, in early archaeology, which a lot of early archaeology, you know, was there were really no schools for it originally back in the 1800s. You kind of learned it on the trade, uh, more or less. Uh, here's some images of some things that were excavated, of course, uh, at Mycenae that's well known. You may have heard about the famous uh, Tholo tombs uh, that are there. Uh, the Tholos tombs are the so-called, they call them beehive tombs, is what they're usually called, which Thalos is, like, I think, the Greek word for beehive. These are beehive-shaped tombs that the Mycenaeans built to bury their kings uh, in. They would put, like, tre elaborate treasures within it uh, as well. And uh, the one you're looking at right here uh, is often called the Treasury of Atreus, uh, which they think may have been built uh, in the 13th century, if that's really true, when the, around when the Trojan War happened right there. And so they may have put the king in there, and probably some of his treasures were, were put in it uh, also. And they think, like, like I told you, uh, Atreus, King Atreus, uh, was the father of king, the later kings Agamemnon and Menelaus, uh, that are mentioned by Homer uh, in, in the Iliad. Here's kind of an entrance of what a Tholos tomb looked like. Uh, and so they would actually bury these tombs, like underground, uh, but they were built with stones that were stacked up using that same kind of method, uh, Cyclopean masonry we talked about. I don't think they used much mortar between the actual stones. It would create kind of a beehive dome shape. They also called dome, dome tombs uh, as well. And so that's kind of what the inside of it looked like. Uh, I think that's the treasure of Atreus that you're looking at. Here's kind of an image of what the top of the dome uh, looks like. So it's kind of an earlier dome. You see a lot like in the Roman world, Greco, Greco Roman world, they built like, you know, dome shaped buildings that you'll have. But that's something that kind of goes back to early Greek and even Egyptian times. They have some kind of things like that going on. It's more like corbeling uh, is what it really is, where you got stones kind of going up until it kind of makes almost like a round arch uh, at the top. Uh, another thing that uh, Schliemann was involved in uh, later, it's very famous at Mycenae, he, he excavated primarily uh, a bunch of graves there, uh, Grave Circle A uh, and Grave Circle B, uh, which uh, these were believed to be royal cemeteries of the Mycenaeans, like the nobility, uh, they were put there, and uh, they employed what they call a shaft grave, where they would dig a shaft down, they would bury people on the bottom, uh, and um, the one you're looking at, Grave Circle A, is really the one that's the most famous one uh, that was found there. Uh, they also have another, which is Grave Circle B, uh, as well. It's not as famous as the other one. Uh, but he did find artifacts in them that are famous. A lot of, lot of uh, gold artifacts were found in it, which especially they found a bunch of these death masks uh, actually buried uh, in the graves. And uh, the, one, the one that he's the most famous he found uh, in the 1870s uh, was the Mask of Agamemnon, uh, which uh, was actually found, I think, I want to say in 1876, I think, when he discovered it. Uh, and um, he thought it looked like Agamemnon or something like that, or could be, and so he kind of gave it that nickname, but they don't know who it is, who the actual death mask is of some kind of My Mycenaean uh, noblemen of, of, of type, uh, and, uh, but they did bury a lot of trinkets in it, cups and other things, jewelry. Uh, I think they found daggers. Uh, I think a lot of their weapons and their armor, I think, were buried in them with them, but we see some, these are some of the gold artifacts that were, of course, found uh, in the actual graves uh, at, at the site of Mycenae back in the 19th century. Uh, now, the big thing I did want to talk about that's real famous about the Mycenaeans, of course, is this connection, you know, with the Trojan War. They think of the Mycenaean culture was somehow involved uh, in the Trojan War, although they're not called Mycenaean, if you know. They're called Achaean is the common name that Homer mentions, of course, uh, in the Iliad. Uh, and um, the Trojan War, if you know about it, 
uh, was believed to have been a mythological war uh, that they think either dates back to the 13th or the 12th century BC. They're not sure if that's really the time period. Though 1250, I think, seems to be kind of a peak period of maybe when it happened, if it did. Mythological, though. So some people think it didn't happen, you know, the war. But um, they do think it was a war between the Greeks uh, in like the mainland and then the Trojans, which were some kind of people uh, that lived in northwestern Turkey. Uh, there's been a lot of debate about who the Trojans were. They think they still don't know who they were. They don't think they were Greeks, although it seems like they're worshiping gods like the Greeks. Seems like it. Uh, maybe Homer thought they were. Uh, but uh, these people uh, were believed to have lived uh, at a site, uh, which I'll kind of show you right here. Let me go down here real quick here. But there's a site called Hisarlik, which uh, was found supposedly by uh, archaeologists in the 19th century, 18, going back to the early 1800s, which is in northwestern Turkey. Uh, this site uh, is believed to be uh, the ancient site of Troy. Uh, and um, I think it's part of the, back then, of course, the Ottoman Empire at the time. Uh, but uh, Hisarlik is a Turkish name that means place of fortifications or place of fortresses. And they do think that this site was evidently used as a heavily fortified city uh, to protect that part of Turkey, which is close to the Aegean Basin and the Dardanelles Strait. Uh, so it had some kind of significance uh, with maybe trade, uh, especially between East and West. You know, you know a lot of trade kind of goes through there later, you know, uh, especially up to Greco-Roman times. Uh, and so Schliemann, they think Schliemann came there in the 1870s and began excavating that site. And so a lot of archaeologists think that Isarlik might be the site of where, you know, Troy was uh, at one point. Well, let me get back to the Trojan War. Well, a little bit about it, uh, more history. So they think that Homer, Homer, uh, you know, like I said, was the one that wrote about, Homer was, you know, famous Greek poet uh, that they think lived either in the 9th century BC, some say 8th century BC uh, as well. The Greeks simply called him the poet. Uh, if you know about that, he's considered the greatest poet uh, in Greek history. But they're not sure if he was a real person or not. I think the Greeks thought he was some kind of barred, blind poet you know, that sang these songs about the Trojan War uh, and also the story of, of Odysseus, you know, the Odyssey uh, later. Uh, Herodotus claims that he lived about maybe the ninth century. So they, they seem to think that's about when maybe uh, he lived uh, overall. And uh, Homer seems to think that this so-called 10-year war uh, was started because of the fact that a Trojan prince by the name of Paris took Helen of Troy uh, from uh, the Spartans. She was actually the um, queen, the queen of uh, and wife of King Menelaus of Sparta, uh, and so that sparked the war that lasted ten years. And I think it was Christopher Marlow that once remarked that it was the so-called face that launched a thousand ships, you know, held of Troy uh, because of that whole issue. Uh, and so that that caused Agamemnon and Menelaus to join up. And eventually, you know, the two two sides, the, the Greeks and the Trojans, did did battle. Yeah, here's some of the famous uh, figures that were kind of involved, of course, uh, with the Trojan War in the story of the Iliad. Uh, of course, uh, like I said, Paris, uh, Hector, you see the two on the right, they were considered the two main sons of Priam. Priam was the king of Troy, uh, and um, those are considered some of the major characters that are, of course, on the Trojan side uh, in the war. Uh, Paris, you see there, is holding kind of an apple that's kind of famous. Uh, according to Homer, uh, there was a quarrel among the goddesses. Uh, over which goddess was the most fairest. Uh, and so uh, there was this thing where they had the judgment of Paris, where uh, Paris was given what they call the golden golden apple of discord. And so he chose Aphrodite 
as the fairest of all the different goddesses. And so what happened was Aphrodite gave Helen of Troy uh, to Paris as a prize. Uh, and so I guess depending on what side you're on, the Greeks thought he kidnapped her, and the Trojans thought she went willingly uh, with him. Uh, Hector, then on the right, you see, of course, uh, is considered to be uh, the greatest hero, like warrior, of course, of the Trojans. Uh, he's, of course, the one that later is killed by Achilles, of course, in battle. Uh, then other figures you see there, you got King Atreus. Uh, he's the father, of course, of King Ag Agamemnon, who's the king of Mycenae. Uh, Agamemnon's the most famous character, really, uh, that leads uh, the Greek forces uh, against the Trojans. And then he's got a brother, of course, Menelaus, who's the king of Sparta uh, also. Uh, but you do have other characters, too, uh, that they have, uh, which are like Achilles, of course, a major character uh, also uh, in the Iliad. He's considered to be the greatest warrior or hero uh, on the Greek side. He's one that's famous for fighting Hector and killing him uh, in single combat. And don't forget Odysseus, the king of Ithaca. He was also involved uh, in the Trojan War. He's also the main character in Homer's uh, The Odyssey, uh, which discusses his journeys back home after the war. Odysseus is the one also, they think, came up with the Trojan horse idea as well. Yeah, of course, they have that image, you know, like a lot of stories they talk about, a lot of Greek stories, uh, how there was this Trojan horse uh, that was used uh, to basically uh, take the city of Troy. Uh, they're not sure if that's really a true story or not. The Homer doesn't really mention anything about a Trojan horse. Uh, it's something that is mostly goes back to writers like the Roman poet Virgil uh, mentions it in his epic, the Aeneid. Uh, in the first century BC, it's kind of debate about what it was. Uh, it may have been a siege engine. Uh, they think, so you, I think there's been some theories it may have been a battering ram uh, also as well. Uh, but Odysseus supposedly used it uh, to put forces inside of it uh, where they brought it into the city and they're able to sack the city from within. Uh, it's basically how, of course, that's done. And so it's kind of like a Trojan horse virus that it gets in your computer and wipes it out from the inside. They say that's what happened, uh, but they're not sure if that's what really occurred with the war or not at the end. Uh, they do find later that from archaeological digs uh, at the site of Hisarlik uh, in Turkey that parts of the city was burned. Uh, that's something they did find evidence of, but they're not sure if it's connected to that story uh, or not. So still kind of debated about that. But yeah, there's the image of Virgil, the idea. We'll talk more about Virgil later when we get more to the like Roman period, but we've already kind of mentioned him before when we were talking about Carthage and all that. Uh, oh, one thing that is very famous, too, also, uh, Schliemann did find this thing called Priam's treasure, by the way, uh, at the site, uh, which was found in the 1870s. And Priam's treasure was some kind of uh, treasure that was found in actually the walls of his Sarlik. He kind of dug out, uh, which I think was, I want to say in 1873 uh, is when it is. I do have some other images of it. Uh, and uh, it is kind of controversial because uh, if you know about Schleiman, he stole it a lot from Turkey. Like it was under the Ottoman Empire and snuck it out of their country and brought it to Germany. And uh, during World War II, uh, the Soviet forces took Berlin. They took the actual Priam's treasure back to the Soviet Union. And now it's in Russia, is where most of the artifacts are today. I think it's in the Pushkin Museum is where it is now. Uh, but they're not sure if it's connected to the same time period or not. Uh, I think they've done some carbon-14 dating on it. It doesn't seem to match uh, the period of the Trojan War. Might be older, going back to 2000 BC. So it's kind of a debate about whether that's really Trojan artifacts or not. There's other sites, just of course, looking at the site of ancient Asarlik. It's about uh, the size of Asarlik. It's about on a it's on an artificial hill, which is called a tell. 
uh, about 50 feet tall, and they think it's about an area of about 60, 650 feet area is about where most of the main buildings are, but on several acres uh, that you're looking at. But they think that uh, a man named Frank Colbert came there originally, a British archaeologist, and he gave Schliemann the idea uh, to excavate there. And so Schliemann came there in the 1870s and did most of his work there. Uh, by the way, they think that Troy was actually nine different cities at one point. Yeah, seriously, Troy one uh, through Troy nine at one point. They think maybe Troy seven might be actually where Troy might have been, uh, which Troy has different names. Uh, the Greeks called it Ilios or Ilion. I think the Romans called it Ilium uh, also, uh, but it does have different names uh, that it's nicknamed. That's maybe what it looked like. Uh, but uh, Schleiman was controversial at the site. Uh, he used dynamite, if you knew about this, in a lot of his excavations. And so, yeah, he really was an amateur archaeologist, uh, in a sense. Uh, archaeologists don't use dynamite anymore. <laughs> that kind of thing. There's other images showing, like, the walls that may have been, uh, you know, Troy. Seems kind of small for Troy, though. Troy's you know, in Homer's Iliad, it seems huge, like gigantic. Uh, and this site is not really that large uh, in comparison, maybe. So here's other images, uh, which are, of course, are, are also uh, right here. Yeah, I'm going to get to it later, but uh, we'll talk about also the rise of the Greek city-states. Uh, but yeah, uh, what's going to happen later, the Mycenaean culture is going to decline. Uh, they think sometime around the 13th century, uh, you get this late Bronze Age collapse that occurs uh, in the Mediterranean world. It happens about the same time when the Sea Peoples invade the region. We've, we've talked about the Sea Peoples uh, before. Uh, there's speculation that the Trojan War may have been somehow connected uh, to the Sea Peoples invasions. Uh, whether which one was the Sea Peoples, they don't know. Uh, but it's a possibility because cities like in Turkey, like Atusa, were destroyed, just like Troy was destroyed. Uh, and so uh, it's a possibility that that's the same kind of time period that we're talking about. But we'll I'll get to it later. Uh, there is a period called the Greek Dark Ages uh, that comes in uh, where Greece in the early Iron Age kind of struggles uh, after the Bronze Age collapse. And you get the rise of the Greek city-states uh, that emerge like around the 8th century BC. So later in the week, I'll be, you know, moving on to talk about, of course, that topic also on ancient Greek, Greece as well. So yeah, I want to get into today and talk about first uh, the background of kind of where we were. I know from the last lecture, I had discussed uh, the Greek Bronze Age, the Aegean civilization, where the Minoans and the Mycenaeans flourished. Uh, throughout the Aegean Basin. Of course, both of those civilizations declined, uh, as you know. Uh, and uh, of course, I'm going I'm to get into and we'll, we'll talk about the, you know, the rise of the Greek city-states that emerge uh, after, after that period. Uh, but um, one of the things that happened, of course, uh, I was kind of getting to in that last lecture was that they have this so-called late Bronze Age collapse that occurs where around close to 1200 BC, you get all these different civilizations like, like that are in the Mediterranean Sea, they collapse, like the Hittites, uh, the Mycenaeans, uh, they think the Minoans had already collapsed. Uh, the New Kingdom, I think, also in Egypt, declined uh, afterwards as well. You know, I think we talked about how it was connected to that so-called uh, Sea Peoples invasion that came in, and that could have been maybe what the Trojan War was about. They, they really don't know. Uh, what the Trojan War was. They're not even sure if it really happened or not. It's kind of considered like a mythological war that was fought, you know, in the Aegean. Uh, and, um, but anyway, what happened was it brought on this kind of like this dark age uh, throughout, throughout the Aegean base. And they often call it the so-called Greek dark ages, which 
peak uh, between about the 11th to about the 8th centuries BC. And so it's kind of at the beginning of the Iron Age uh, when that starts. And Greece gets invaded by these peoples uh, that are later called the Hellens. The Hellens, they're called, uh, which looks like Dorian invasion, I think is another term uh, they'll use for it. But the Hellens were like the Greek-speaking peoples of the Aegean that will eventually settle there you know, like the Spartans and the Athenians and all those others that they have later. Uh, and um, I think I've got an image kind of showing uh, kind of a slide right here. They often call the Dorian invasion is kind of the nickname of this period when they when these peoples come in and take over uh, the Aegean region. Uh, although if you know about it, uh, they were made up of different tribes that uh, were descended from this man that they call uh, Helen. I'll kind of show an image right here. Uh, Helen Helen was a, a, some kind of Greek ancestor of the Greeks. Uh, they think he may have been a mythological king of some type. I think there's even claims that he was descended from Zeus uh, from a long time ago. And he had a bunch of uh, children, and all these children were kind of made up of what will be like Greek tribes that that you know live throughout the Aegean. I've got kind of a slide I'll share with you right here. But uh, he's got a bunch of sons and grandsons. Uh, he's got three sons: uh, Doris, Zuthus, and Aeolus. And he's got two grandsons: uh, Chius uh, and Ion. So there's there's those names right there. And so you end up with all these different um, Greek tribes uh, that that follow. Uh, and um, I think they're usually broken down into like three or four. Another one on the far left, Doris, will be your Dorian tribes, your Dorians, uh, basically. Uh, Zuthus uh, had two sons, uh, Chius and Ion. They kind of split uh, into two different tribes, uh, which are the so-called Achaeans. And then you got the Ionians. And then you got Aeolus, of course, the so-called Aeolians. Maybe you want them right here on the screen. Uh, those are really four tribes, not three. Uh, and, um, and of course, from these different, you know, Greek tribes, you get different dialects of Greek. Uh, the two most famous ones, you know, are Doric, which like the Spartans would speak, that form of Greek dialect. And then like if you go to Athens, uh, of course, Ionic Greek, of course, uh, is spoken uh, which is also spoken like in Western Turkey, too, uh, as well. So that's kind of like the different ancestors that really made up of what will be, of course, the Greeks over time. Uh, of course, uh, if you think about it, uh, the word, you know, Helen is kind of the term they use now for someone who's a Greek. So if you're like a woman or a man, you know, uh, Helen is a, is a Greek person. Uh, if you're talking about the Helens, you're talking about all the Greek peoples. Uh, and then Helles, so Helles will be, the, of course, the Greek word, uh, of course, for uh, what is Greece itself, like the Republic of Helles. Um, and also the term Hellenic will be used a lot, too, Hellenic uh, pertaining to, you know, the Greeks uh, and all their history and so on, culture. Uh, later, the, the Romans, you know, the Romans were the ones that kind of coined the term Greece, uh, you know, Greece, I think Grecia, I think is the Greek word uh, for, for Greece. Uh, so they're the ones that kind of use that term later to describe, you know, what is the Hellens, the, the people of Greece. All right, uh, yeah, let me also uh, go back and talk about a few other things. Uh, so, yeah, uh, if you look at that slide right there, uh, the Greeks recover over time from the Dark Age. It takes a few, few centuries, uh, but they think by about, close to about the 8th century, that the Greeks start dividing into what are called uh, city-states, uh, which are called a polis, uh, or if you want the plural, it's poli, uh, which uh, that's just the Greek word for what they call a city or even a state. Uh, and it's kind of like the Greek word for what would be uh, civilization. Now, I think the Roman word or Latin word is civitas, uh, civilization. Uh, for cities later, uh, but the polis, the, the word polis, you know, is where we get a lot of words like 
policy, politics, uh, even the word police uh, comes, of course, from that word uh, over time. Uh, so all these different city states are based, you know, throughout, you know, the Aegean Basin. Uh, and um, there's hundreds of them. I forget the exact number. There may have been over a thousand, maybe 1,200 city states that, you know, range throughout that whole region, not just in the Aegean Basin, but uh, other areas close to Italy and close to the Black Sea uh, and so on. Uh, and um, that period of Greece we'll get to a little later is going to be often referred to as the so-called Hellenic Age or some people call it the Greek Age, I think is another nickname. Uh, they also call it uh, as as well. Uh, now, um, I'll kind of talk about first, I'll kind of get into it. And by the way, these are some of the different, you know, city states uh, we'll kind of be talking about off and on. Uh, you've got Athens and Sparta. Those two really are considered, you know, the ones that were the most famous. Uh, Sparta was the largest of the different city-states. Uh, Athens may have been one of the most populated, uh, of course, most famous uh, for its culture, uh, for its democracy. Uh, you have Thebes, you've heard of, of course, uh, in, uh, whereas Boeotia, uh, Corinth, of course, is famous. Delphi, also in Boeotia. Olympia, it's kind of in the Peloponnesus Peninsula. And then you have Argos, also in the Peloponnesus Peninsula as well. So those are examples of different city-states uh, throughout that region. I think I've got a map. I can show kind of a map of the region of, of like uh, Greece. Of course, there's kind of, kind of a map of Greece uh, you're looking at. Uh, right there, uh, let me see if I can find one. Here it is right here, kind of kind of showing you kind of an area, range of, of Greece right there, of course. There's, of course, Athens. Athens, you know, is the capital of the Republic of Greece, uh, yeah, Republic of Greece, or Republic of Hellas uh, today. You see, of course, the modern city of Athens on the right. Uh, Athens' population, I think the modern city today is like something like 3 million kind of live uh, in there, but they do think that the average population probably of the Greek world uh, a long time ago was closer to like something like four or five million was kind of lived throughout the Aegean Basin to kind of give you an idea. That would be like around the fourth or fifth centuries BC uh, when that was. I think I've got another image right here showing like the whole Aegean region that uh, we're talking about in Greek, the Greek world. Uh, so, yeah, you can see they had Greek city-states all throughout that whole region. So, of course, Crete down there on the bottom. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> there's different parts of Greece I think I've talked about before. But you see the Peloponnese or Peloponnesus uh, on the bottom. Uh, that's, that's basically that peninsula there. It's got a bunch of city-states throughout that region like Sparta. Uh, Olympia, Corinth, Argos, I think those are your most famous uh, city-states. Pylos, too, I think I've got there as well. That's in there. And, of course, above that is Attica, Attica Peninsula, which is where Athens is, uh, something like 150 miles uh, straight from Sparta would be kind of where it's located. Above above that uh, is like Thebes and Delphi, which uh, an area sometimes called Boeotia uh, in that area. Then you go up in the Thesley, uh, close to where like Mount Olympus is and all that. Uh, and then you got Thrace, of course, on the northern coast of Greece, uh, above the Aegean. Uh, in the western part, Turkey uh, has got different areas uh, also. Uh, Ephesus, Miletus, I think those are kind of famous city-states that are kind of an area called sometimes Ionia. It's kind of in an area like that northwestern, north north eastern coast of Turkey, I believe, is where that is. You also got a lot of islands, of course, uh, in in the Aegean, too, where there's also city-states. So a lot of islands are kind of independent uh, city-states, including like Rhodes, Lesbos, and, of course, a few others. Eboa, see, also uh, as well above Attica. But, yeah, those two states, Athens, the most powerful state, Sparta, of course, uh, one of the largest cities because it controls the bottom of the Peloponnese Peninsula. And it's more known for its military. Uh, it's got a smaller population probably compared to Athens, 
Uh, but both of those will, of course, dominate the Aegean world eventually. Uh, usually they have, if you study about Greek history, they divide it into different periods. Like they have what they call the Hellenic Age or just simply Greek Age is what it usually means, uh, which is the peak period of the Greek city-states, uh, which date from, uh, they think, the uh, ancient Olympics, which they think started in the year 776 B.C., at least traditionally the date. Uh, and it goes down to the death of Alexander the Great uh, in 323 B.C. So it's a period of like four or five centuries when the Greek city-states were at their peak of dominance. Uh, and uh, they usually subdivide it uh, into different periods. They have like Old Greece or sometimes called Archaic Greece, uh, which goes back to the Olympics, close to 776, and it usually includes like the 8th century down to like about uh, the 6th century would be the period of it. And then you have what they call the Classical Greece, uh, which is from like 500 to close to about the 5th century, uh, down to about the death of Alexander the Great in 323 B.C. And uh, the Classical Greece uh, is considered important because it's considered the peak period of the Greek city-states, uh, not just that, uh, but also um, like when Greece, like its culture was at its pinnacle. You know, it's kind of a golden age. I think it's like also the golden age of Greece or golden age of Athens also kind of occurs around that same time period. And uh, you get a lot of famous people that lived during that time. I kind of got a list of them I'll kind of share with you, but uh, these are kind of famous people that lived during the classical period of Greece. Uh, Herodotus and Thucydides are probably the two most famous historians that lived uh, during that time. Solon the Wise, of course, a famous politician of Athens. So is Cleisthenes. Cleisthenes was a famous politician of Athens. Uh, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. You've probably heard of all three of those. Sometimes called the big three. Uh, those are considered probably the greatest philosophers of ancient Greece. Uh, Lycurgus, you may have heard of him, and Leonidas were famous Spartan kings of well-known. Uh, Leonidas is famous for the Battle of Thermopylae. Uh, Themistocles uh, was a famous Athenian politician and also kind of like a general that was well-known during the Greco-Persian Wars. Uh, Pericles was an Athenian politician and general, also fought during the Greco-Persian Wars. Uh, Sophocles, you've heard of him, a famous Greek playwright who wrote Oedipus Rex, Pythagoras, famous mathematician of the Greeks. Hippocrates, uh, you've heard of him, he's a famous Greek doctor. They think he's the father of medicine. Uh, Archimedes, famous Greek engineer and inventor, like the Archimedean screw or whatever they call it. Uh, Philip II, Alexander the Great, of course, famous kings. Uh, of Macedonia. Of course, Alexander the Great would go on to conquer most of the known world uh, at the time. So those are all famous, you know, Greek city-states that are, of course, well known. Uh, one thing about I'll get to today and talk about with these Greek city-states, most of them were built on high points. Uh, if you know about this, uh, they often call it an Acropolis. Uh, and uh, Acropolis uh, was used as a uh, area to defend the city. So it's kind of like a fortified citadel uh, where they could evacuate to uh, if they were attacked by other states. Uh, and um, of course, I'll get to it today. Uh, the most famous Acropolis is the one at Athens, the so-called Acropolis of Athens, which I'll talk about today. Uh, by the way, the word uh, Acropolis, if you want to know in Greek, it means uh, the top of the city or the high point of the city. And uh, on that high point, uh, they would build a lot of public buildings uh, for the people, uh, such as temples and so on. But here's kind of, you can show kind of an image uh, of the Acropolis of Athens, which some of the buildings, you know, they're trying to rebuild uh, in the Republic of Greece right now, especially the Parthenon. Uh, they're trying to reconstruct it, which I'm not sure how much far they're going to go with that. Uh, but it's kind of controversial because, you know, who knows what it really looked like before. But um, these are some of the public buildings that, of course, are on the Acropolis of Athens. Of course, the Parthenon, uh, which I told you about. Uh, the Propylaea, uh, which is kind of like a main entrance 
uh, into the actual Acropolis that's there. Uh, the Rectotheon, uh, which is a temple that they also erected, uh, the Athenians, I think that honored uh, mostly uh, the goddess Athena, but also um, the god Poseidon. Uh, and then also the temple of Athena Nike uh, is also a famous temple that's on the site too, uh, near the Propylaea. And uh, most of those buildings were built by this famous politician uh, who lived in the fifth century BC, Pericles, who was also a Greek general uh, as well. And uh, I've got other images, of course, to show here. Here's course, kind of a map of the Acropolis. Uh, the Acropolis is actually about 400 something feet above the rest of the city of Athens. Kind of, kind of overlooks it, uh, which you saw that short video uh, at the beginning. Uh, but the main entrance into it is kind of on the bottom left where the Propylaea is. We walk in there. I think I've got an image uh, showing that where uh, I think people are kind of walking into it. Uh, for walking out of it on the right, uh, which you see there. There's other images, of course, of it. You can see above uh, with that right there. Uh, now, by the way, uh, the, the actual Parthenon on the bottom right, uh, why is it all damaged? Well, in 1687, uh, the Venetians and, and from Venice, when it was, which is in Italy, were at war with the Ottoman Empire. I think this was part of the period of the so-called Great Turkish War. It was being fought in the late 17th century. And anyway, the Venetians bombarded uh, the Acropolis uh, with cannon fire from their ships. And apparently the Turks were using the uh, Parthenon to store like gunpowder and weapons and hit, hit it and blew it up. Uh, and so most of the roof was blown up. Uh, and so they're trying to fix it. So that's the whole reason why it looks that way. And a lot of images, like real damaged, et cetera. But yeah, you can see other images, like the Rectotheon is up there kind of to the left of the Parthenon. Uh, suppose there's an a olive tree that's there that some Greeks claim that that was the first olive tree that the goddess Athena put there, of course, which Athena is the patron goddess, you know, of Athens. Uh, and uh, so you got the Parthenon to the right. Uh, there used to be a kind of old Acropolis Museum, you see, that's kind of to the back of the Parthenon. They, they've moved that, a new museum that's off, off site, of course. That's the one that Obama was touring, that short video. They do have some Greek temples uh, that are kind of also connected to uh, around, the, around the Acropolis as well. Here's other images, of course, showing, of course, the uh, Acropolis, which is right there. But yeah, most city-states had some kind of Acropolis like this high point uh, where they built built their uh, city up, of course, and was used as predominantly as a fortification. Now, here's another image, of course, the Propylaea. Uh, of course, here's the Temple of Athena Nike. Uh, it honors, of course, the goddess Athena, but also the goddess Nike, which Nike also called Victoria by the Romans later, was the god, god of, goddess of victory, of course. So it's kind of a little small uh, temple there. And it's got those uh, kind of like um, ionic columns uh, on it in that image right there. Now you got the Parthenon, uh, which I think there may have been a temple before that, but it was destroyed by the Persians. And so the one you're looking at was the temple that was constructed by uh, Pericles uh, back in the late 5th century, and if they think it was completed close to about maybe around 430 B.C., roughly, uh, when it was finished. And if you know about the Parthenon, it's considered to be one of the great classical architect feats of the Greeks. So it's really the greatest classical architecture of, of, of the known world, and that's why everybody wants to go look at it. Uh, but like right now, they're trying to, of course, fix it up, uh, of course. So um, let's see what else. Here's, of course, another image. Uh, they do think there were two statues in it, by the way. Uh, there was a statue of Athena inside of it, and then there was one outside of it uh, also uh, as well. So predominantly it was built to honor her reign, but also it was kind of built as a war memorial uh, to honor uh, those soldiers that had died uh, in the Greco-Persian wars against the Persian Empire. Uh, and I think it was used as a bank. Like if you want to put money somewhere, you could put it in a temple. <laughs> uh, Rectotheon, like I told you, was another temple they also erected uh, the, around the time of Pericles, uh, which honored, like I said, 
uh, the goddess Athena, but also the god Poseidon uh, as well. Now, they also got the Agora, uh, which is kind of below the Acropolis uh, at Athens. Uh, and other city states have Agoras, or also pronounced it Agora. You want to see it that way uh, as well. Uh, it's a type of centralized public square, which has like public buildings that are part of it. Uh, the term Agora means uh, either gathering place or assembly area where the citizens uh, would all meet. It has been compared to like the Roman Forum, like at Rome and other Roman cities uh, overall. And uh, it was used for different functions. Uh, they would meet there, I guess, buildings for public affairs, uh, but also like markets, uh, probably forms of entertainment, baths and things like that. Uh, so it's, and they have also temples there too. Uh, and so all that's kind of equated to like the Rome, kind of like the Roman Forum in a sense, kind of a similarity to it. I think I've got another image showing like one at Ephesus uh, as well, where they have kind of a agora uh, there uh, as well. So it's kind of like a public square uh, where most of the citizens, of course, could do different things uh, within the city state. Now, also about the Greeks, they had different forms of government that they had, that they kind of experimented with. Uh, at least four different types of governments uh, were popular. Uh, of course, the ones that they always talk about the most is democracy uh, and, of course, the so-called oligarchy. Uh, those two were really the two most popular forms of government in the ancient Greek world. Uh, I'll kind of share with you a little bit about all those different types. Uh, traditionally, the one that was the oldest was the monarchy. You can see it went back to like something like before 800 B.C., uh, where they were ruled by kings. And of course, it was inherited power, passed down, hereditary, you know, to their children, like their sons, could be a queen uh, also. Uh, and um, <clears throat> so, yeah, that that's traditionally, uh, I think the only state that kind of has that later a lot is Sparta. Sparta has, you know, traditionally two kings later, uh, but they have kind of like an oligarchy, as you'll see later. And oligarchies were popular too. Uh, especially going back like 800, 8 to about the 7th centuries when they were popular the most. And uh, that was a type of government where they were ruled by a few people, ruled by a few, uh, which will be mostly like wealthy nobility, like the upper class controlling everything. Uh, and uh, the best example of that was Sparta. Sparta had, you know, the best example of an oligarchy. And they tried to spread their ideas of government to people uh, overall. Uh, you also have what they call a tyranny uh, as well, tyrants. Uh, tyrannies were like a rule by a, by a tyrant, uh, which that's where a nobleman like an aristocrat would seize power and he had like absolute power over the state. Usually they would sometimes cancel like the constitution if they had one, uh, suspend some laws. Uh, and tyrants were equivalent to like, um, like a dictator late, later. Uh, I think the Roman dictator we see later is kind of equivalent to it. <clears throat> and then the democracy, uh, that's the one thing that's more famous uh, than anything. Uh, democracy, of course, meaning ruled by, by the people. And of course, uh, from the Greek word demokratia, uh, was an Athenian style government where all the male citizens took turns in, in you know, ruling the state or running for office uh, or voting. Uh, and so that's something that's unique, you know, about Athens. Uh, that particular form of government was the most influential in the world overall, uh, not just in Europe, but rest of the world in general, like in, especially in the West. <clears throat> and so a lot of governments, of course, were heavily influenced by that, of course, uh, you know, today. So yeah, it's something they're kind of famous for, you know, democracy uh, throughout the world. Uh, however, you see there, male citizens, women didn't really have any political rights or anything like that. So you don't really see that closer to even like modern times, uh, believe it or not. Uh, now, of course, the other thing, of course, we'll talk about too is military uh, as well. Uh, a lot of city states relied on a national defense where they had these citizen armies uh, that fought for their state. 
uh, of course, called militias that they have. And uh, Greeks had infantry foot soldiers were pretty much the main people that were part of their, their traditional armies, Iron Age armies, uh, which were called a hoplite, so-called hoplites, uh, which you see in that image right there. Uh, and um, hoplites were uh, heavily armed soldiers that used um, spears uh, in formation, uh, usually with overlapping uh, shields, and I'll get to it later, they use what they call a phalanx formation to, of course, fight in. Uh, and um, hoplites, hoplites, um, <clears throat> most, most traditional states had some kind of form of a militia that they had. Uh, most of them were citizen armies, but there were a few uh, that had professional armies, like Sparta probably would be the best example of having a professional army. So did um, also Macedonia. Uh, they would, of course, had one of the best later uh, that'll conquer all of Greece. But uh, most most hoplites, uh, like especially like like Athens and other some other states, uh, had some kind of occupation. Uh, most of them came from the middle class. Uh, in fact, a lot of them were farmers, uh, or they were artisans of some type, where they uh, had some kind of kind of um, skill they had. Like I don't know if you know about Socrates. Uh, was a philosopher, but he was also a stonemason, and his father was a stonemason uh, also as well. So uh, they were trained on the side uh, militarily, and then they had a real job. Uh, they had it's almost kind of like the National Guard or something like that. It'd be kind of like kind of what was it kind of equivalent to in a sense. Uh, here, of course, you can see this image right here, but the phalanx, the so-called Greek phalanx, that was the main battle formation that Greeks used uh, in, of course, the Greek world. It's used down like the time of Alexander the Great and afterwards, even fighting against the Romans later, proved to be not as good as the Roman legion. <clears throat> but uh, the, term, the term phalanx is a Greek word meaning battle line, is what it means. It's a rectangular battle formation where you have these hoplite infantry foot soldiers uh, fighting close, you know, close formation using uh, spears and overlapping shields. And um, how a phalanx usually worked was that the soldiers that are in the back would push the men forward and literally drive the other formation that they're fighting against off the field of battle and destroy it. Uh, and so, um, the shields were kind of important because they you know, protecting not just themselves, but the guy next to them uh, also as well. <clears throat> and um, when they, you know, broke formation, they would then use like also swords uh, in battle. Got different uh, images, of course, showing, uh, I guess, kind of re reenactors, I guess, that are kind of like one on the left is hoplite. Then you got some Roman legionnaires uh, as an example uh, right there. But you can see some of the um, equipment that a lot of these hoplites had to wear, like armor uh, and, of course, the weapons uh, that went with it. Uh, traditionally, a lot of these, like I said, came from the middle class. Uh, and so a lot of them had to buy their own weapons, uh, their own armor. So the state didn't really give it to them, uh, if you know about that. Uh, and um, Kind of show other images, <clears throat> which is right here. <clears throat> they had different kinds of weapons they used, and by the way. Uh, the Zippos, <clears throat> which you see right there on the right and on the left. The Zippos, of course, traditionally was the type of uh, sword that they used, which uh, Zippos is just Greek for, for sword. Uh, it's what it means. And um, there were two types of um, Greek swords. They had the traditional straight sword, what you see on the bottom <clears throat> or at the left. And then you had also what they call the copus, uh, copus, K-O-P-I-S, uh, which was kind of like what they call a curved sword. Uh, so I think that was kind of a popular sword. I think the one on the top right may have been the one that the Spartans used a lot in battle. I think they had longer swords too if you're a cavalry, cavalryman, like a knight, you know, they had a longer sword. Uh, of course, they also had, uh, if you go back to it too, I didn't show you this real quick, but the actual uh, primary weapon that they used uh, in a phalanx is called a dory, which is just Greek for spear. 
Uh, and hoplite spear was traditionally eight to 10 feet, I guess would be kind of the range it could be uh, on average. Uh, usually had a wooden shaft uh, that was maybe about uh, two inches in diameter, which probably weighed about three to four pounds at the most. That's how heavy hoplite spear uh, was. Uh, it's made of different types of wood, the actual shaft, uh, which either from the ash tree or Cornell tree. Uh, and um, you see there that, that uh, reenactor um, hoplite spears were basically thrusted overhand, like at the enemy in front of you. And so the first few rows might be trying to stab guys in front of them uh, that are in front of their formation. <clears throat> and then like if you break formation, uh, you would then pull your sword out, which a lot of times was kept behind the actual shield. Uh, itself. <clears throat> uh, they had different kinds. I'll kind of maybe get to it later. Uh, but uh, Macedonia, they had uh, what they call a sarissa, which is like a, a pike, which a pike is like a long spear, uh, which they vary in length. Like, I don't know, 15 to 20 feet probably was the average. 18 feet might be a good average. 18 foot spear. And uh, those were used uh, to repel not just uh, other infantry that might try to attack them, uh, lunge at them, but uh, cavalry uh, as well to stop cavalry charging at infantry. And uh, something that Macedonia developed uh, under the kings like Philip II and also Alexander the Great. Uh, they used those a lot, uh, especially in the center of their armies. And those were heavy spears. I'll get to, I think I've got some images later over there. I think they weighed up like something like 12 to 14 pound range. Uh, of course, they also had different kinds of armor. Uh, the Traditionally, the Corinthian style helmet was the one that's the most famous <clears throat> that they used. Uh, these were uh, bronze, bronze helmets that were used uh, by Greek and also Roman armies uh, as well <clears throat> in the Greco-Roman world. That's the one traditionally you'll see uh, people wearing, a lot of different <clears throat> hoplite soldiers. Yeah, here's other images right here uh, showing the so-called Corinthian style helmet uh, that was very popular uh, in the Greek world. Uh, didn't really have any ear holes, by the way, <clears throat> on the side, so that was kind of kind of made it difficult. Uh, it almost became more like a hat you wore as you kind of pulled over uh, your head. Uh, of course, they had different kinds of armor. On the left, you have what they call a cuirass, uh, which cuirass uh, is like a type of um, body armor that kind of wraps around you. I think they call it torso armor is what they dub it. Uh, and then on the right, they had also what they call linothorax, which is a type of linen armor uh, they had that was kind of popular. And then sometimes they had layered armor too uh, as well. I think they call it sometimes lamellar. Uh, also, uh, but there are different types of armor that were worn. Uh, the cuirass, which you see on the left, uh, was more heavier. Uh, also, they had different kinds of shields. Also, the hoplon was the so-called round shield. Uh, it's actually where the word hoplite originated from, because uh, the carrier of these shields uh, in battle and uh, traditional hoplons were made of oak wood, uh, about two inches thick, uh, like it says. And they would usually put a bronze skin on the outside of it uh, to you know, make it tough, tough, toughen up. Uh, and uh, they would also put images on the outside of it, which might represent, you know, the actual city state that they're fighting for. So hoplons, uh, the Greeks, you know, traditionally preferred a round shield. Uh, you'll see later, like other states, like the Romans uh, prefer uh, more of a rectangular square shield. <clears throat> uh, they also have other kinds of armor, like they have what they call greaves, also, which you see on the left and on the right. Uh, greaves are just basically uh, what they call leg armor, which that could be made of different things, also like bronze, leather, uh, even cloth. Uh, also, uh, so those were be kind of used to protect your your shin, your legs, 
Uh, didn't have much protection for your feet, though. Uh, that's the way they wore, like, just a traditional sandal, like the Romans. Sometimes they, uh, they would take their dories and stab you in the foot or try to stab you in your genitals or something like that, kind of a, <clears throat> you know, <laughs> bad thing, I guess they would try to do to people. Uh, but um, you can see a traditional hoplite soldier up there with the hoplon. He's got the linen tunic or linothorax. Uh, they got armor. And the guy on the right looks like he's got the cuirass torso armor instead. <clears throat> but most most dories, uh, the uh, spears, uh, had two tips to it, uh, which one might be the main primary tip. And he obviously had a second tip if one of them broke out, broke off. Yeah, here's kind of a phalanx formation using a long spear. We call it pike. Uh, so traditionally, they have those later. Uh, it varied on uh, phalanx sizes. Uh, it was all dependent on basically the depth of it. So, you know, it depends on how deep the rank was. Like an eight rank phalanx had a lot more men in it compared to a 16 rank one. <clears throat> so, and I think there's even cases where some of the Macedonian ones were like 32 rank. So it was like massive uh, formations. But uh, most of those formations later proved to be not as good as the Roman legions um, that eventually a fight against the Greeks. They get beat later by that. <clears throat> now, let me go on. I want to also talk about the rivalry of Athens and Sparta. Uh, so both these you know, states had their own armies uh, traditionally, but they were kind of different from each other culturally. Uh, if you know about Athens and Sparta, Athens was more known for its culture. That's the one thing about it. Uh, a lot of arts, uh, democracy, philosophy, history, uh, those kind of things. Uh, and then Sparta traditionally was known for its military, very little culture uh, in general. Uh, in fact, the Athenians thought the Spartans were kind of almost barbaric, uh, in a sense, uncouth, you know, compared to them. But, but the Athenians were more civilized, uh, that kind of thing. <clears throat> so I'll kind of go through today uh, and talk about, you know, the differences between these two different city-states. Uh, let me go ahead and, uh, of course, show you kind of another image uh, of the Greek world <clears throat> again, of course. So you can see Sparta is on the bottom of Greece, uh, that area of the, the so-called uh, Peloponnesus. You've got, like, uh, they call it different names, Peloponnese or Peloponnesus. Uh, that's the so-called bottom peninsula of Greece. Looks like a four-fingered hand, uh, kind of the way it looks. Uh, right there. And Sparta is a Dorian state that mostly dominates the bottom of it, uh, like especially the area of where Laconia is uh, today. Uh, and there's another area kind of the west, I'll get to it, uh, which is called Messenia. So both those areas are kind of controlled uh, by them. Uh, and then you can see Athens is kind of to the north, northeast of, of Sparta. Uh, and I think it's like 150 miles straight. Like if you go by, I guess, like a plane flying straight to it, it's about that far uh, from, almost dead east of it. Um, and so you can see the different locations. And Athens located on a peninsula called Attica is what they call that area. Uh, of course, here's kind of another map showing you the different peninsulas, you know, throughout the region. So, yeah, Attica right there where Athens is. They got like right below that the um, Isthmus of Corinth, it's called, that kind of connects it uh, as well. And then you got the Peloponnese or Peloponnesus, which of course is uh, below it, uh, right, right there. But yeah, a little bit about Sparta. Uh, like I said, Sparta kind of goes back to the Greek Dark Ages, uh, they think. Uh, they think that's when the actual traditional Spartan state we know uh, really started uh, in the Greek age. Um, you know, you have the Mycenaean Sparta. They had a long time ago, like Menelaus, that we talked about, like so-called Trojan War. That's if he existed. We're not really sure if he was a real king uh, or, or not. Uh, what we know is that uh, sometime during the uh, Greek, at the end of the Greek Dark Age, they think the Spartan state uh, probably 
uh, began to develop. I want to say 10th, 9th century is, is they think the time period of when that state really got started. Uh, a little bit about their names. That's one thing about Sparta. It, it goes by different names. Uh, Sparta is like the name of the city, more or less, where the state is based around. Uh, it does have another name that they call it traditionally, which is uh, lack of diamond. Uh, which lack of diamond was what they call the Spartan homeland or Spartan country, like where the city of Sparta was. It's kind of like its capital. Uh, and uh, it's believed the name is derived from a mythological king of Greece who lived in that area named lack of diamond. They believe he was a son of Zeus uh, in origin. And uh, traditionally knows, if you know about this, uh, he had a, a wife uh, who was his queen, uh, whose name was Sparta. And so here's the, the name of the city, of course, the Spartans kind of comes from later uh, over time. Now, I guess you can see there some of the things I'll kind of I'll get to it later about, about the Spartans, but they'll eventually take over that whole region uh, of the southern part of the Peloponnese. Let me go back to it uh, right here, but they have like this uh, kind of, you can see that area which is on the bottom there, uh, those are the areas where Sparta will kind of dominate. So Laconia is the, the centralized area of about where uh, the city-state is roughly, but they also control that area to the west that's called Messenia uh, as well. I think I've got a better map uh, showing it right here. So you can see Sparta is located right there. And Laconia, which, by the way, Laconia is spelled different ways. You'll see it spelled with a C, and then sometimes you'll see it with a K, like traditionally with, with a C, usually. It's just the Greek uh, transliteration uh, of it. Uh, but um, that whole area, uh, the Spartans will kind of subjugate Messenia, uh, which you see there. Uh, and I'll get to the so-called helots later. Uh, helots, which I think were mostly in Messenia, in that in that area, will be kind of like become like slaves uh, of the Spartans uh, over time. Uh, before I get to that, I did want to talk about Lycurgus. Uh, he's kind of an important figure uh, in Spartan history, going back to either the ninth or the eighth centuries. There's kind of a debate about when he lived. Uh, he's kind of considered like a mythological king of Sparta kind of like Menelaus, and um, they believe he's considered important because they think Lycurgus was the one that helped found the traditional Spartan state that'll, you know, exist during the Greek age, uh, and uh, he developed a lot of their traditions, like their military traditions. Uh, he developed a lot of their laws, uh, their courts. Um, I think there was even a case where, uh, I think later, some of the Greeks called uh, the laws of Lycurgus, it was called the Code of Lycurgus or something like that. Uh, and um, he's kind of comparable to um, Solon, the wise, who was a famous politician, of course, of Athens. I think those two kind of almost comparable uh, to each other. I think I've got other images here, but here's kind of like a pyramid scheme of like what Spartan society uh, traditionally look like. Now, I'll get to it later, but Sparta's an oligarchy, uh, that type of government. But uh, traditionally, most of the citizens that dominate it are your Spartan nobility, uh, which is pretty much your primary uh, upper class. Uh, and then you have what they call the peroikoi, uh, which is kind of like these free non-citizens that live uh, in, in the Spartan territories a lot of them are kind of like a middle class. They're, I think a lot of them are like artisans and merchants that run a lot of the businesses uh, throughout um, the Spartan state. Uh, and they do have some political rights, but not equal to, of course, the Spartans. And I think that map showed you, if we go back up to what I was showing right here, uh, some of those cities that are, I think, in blue are cities where these middle class people had some power, and included some foreigners that would come to uh, the city-state, but they didn't have the same equal power or equal rights as citizens that might come to Athens and live there uh, overall. 
Uh, yeah, going back to that, of course, pyramid, uh, social pyramid of Sparta. Uh, of course, on the bottom was the so-called helots. Uh, and uh, the helots were considered a type of um, people of that region that were basically considered slaves of the Sparta, agricultural slaves. Though it's been debated about whether they were slaves or like a serf. I think it's been kind of compared uh, with each other, but it's believed that helots made up a majority of the population of the Spartan state. I think uh, Herodotus claimed that they outnumbered them like seven to one, and helot rebellions were quite common, where they would rebel against the Spartans. And supposedly that's why the Spartans became such a military society, because uh, they always had to be on alert in case they rebelled against them. And quite often, I think they you could read about in history how the Spartans would sometimes even kill helots. They got they got too many of them. And I think I think a right of a Spartan soldier when he's training, uh, when he's young, uh, you're supposed to sneak out your barrack and kill a helot, uh, you know, without being caught. Uh, but anyway, yeah, of course, one thing that they talk about, too, that um, supposedly King Lycurgus created was the so-called Agog, which if you know about the Agog, the Agog was like the Spartan military school where they trained Spartan soldiers uh, from young boys, uh, which supposedly the word uh, Agog or Agaga, maybe in Latin, um, means to raise or to rear. Uh, and so... Uh, you know about uh, Spartans, uh, when they were infants, uh, they would actually uh, basically uh, take a baby, and if it's got some kind of defect or they don't think it's going to grow up to be big and strong, they'll actually let, leave them to die. Uh, so they don't want to be weak or anything like that. And then uh, at the age of seven, boys are taken from their parents, uh, and they're put into these schools and um, reading and writing not considered important. Yeah, it's true about that. And so they do a lot of, you know, fitness testing, you know, military style training. Uh, it's like Marines <laughs> starting from the age of seven, I guess, instead. But um, from seven to like, I think, 29 or whatever, you, you actually have to live within barracks uh, with, with other men, uh, you know, in this training uh, and uh, so from the, I think it's from like from the seven, uh, yeah, seven to 20, I think is the main years where they go through military training, uh, where they live in barracks. And a lot of the main soldiers that are in the Spartan army and a lot of their main leaders are kind of chosen during that time uh, the two, you know, lead the Spartan, Spartan armies, of course, later. But yeah, they actually can't live with their wife until like they turn about 30, believe it or not. Uh, and a lot of them are in the military until they're like 60 years old. That's a long time, uh, unless they get killed. Uh, of course, girls had more rights than other Greek women, which is true about that. They had some military training they went through, but a lot of the training of women uh, was more geared uh, towards really uh, educating them and, uh, I guess, prepping them for marriage, you know, raising families, uh, things like that. Uh, but uh, they had more rights than most, you know, Greek women throughout the, the Greek world, uh, except. And quite often they had to marry more often uh, because a lot of husbands either were gone from war, they got killed. Uh, and so oftentimes there were more women than men uh, in Spartan society. Uh, Spartan society, by the way, was very egalitarian. That's something that's true about it. They all kind of dressed the same, wore similar kind of, you know, style uniforms. Uh, and uh, they didn't do a whole lot of manual work or anything like that. They were traditional soldiers. And the helots, you know, were used to do all the work, like especially agricultural work, farming, uh, et cetera. They weren't very materialistic either, the Spartans. Uh, very little culture. Uh, I think they used iron as money instead of like gold, silver, or whatever uh, people used money for back in those days. You know, like I said, the Spartans had little culture uh, compared to, say, the Athenians, of course. Uh, then you have the Spartan government, which I told you the Spartans had an oligarchy, uh, which, which they had. 
Uh, usually when a Spartan soldier turned 30, uh, you could participate with the actual government, uh, like with its assembly, uh, various councils, uh, be, even be elected as a magistrate uh, to, to the state. And uh, if you study about the Spartan government, traditionally it was an oligarchy where they had two kings. Uh, one king was used to run the army, you see, and they had another king was in charge of matters at home, like domestic stuff. And then you see they had what they call a council of elders, which I've got the name for it if you want. The council of elders was called a garousia, uh, and it had 30 men on it, 28 citizens that were over 60 that had already been in the military that were retired. And then he had two kings on it. The two kings were on it too uh, as well. And the council of elders acted as kind of like a court too, like an actual court, like a, as judges of law and things like that. Uh, and I guess they helped advise the kings. Uh, and then yet also the appella, the appella was the Spartan assembly uh, where you could uh, approve various uh, laws and things like that uh, overall. So that's that's how kind of the, the Spartan government was broken down. Uh, it's almost a cross between a monarchy and a democracy in a sense, but only a democracy among predominantly the Spartans, uh, that male Spartans, they could you know, participate openly uh, in it. Uh, they also had these uh, men uh, that were in the government uh, that are called ephors. You may have heard of them. They had five of them. And uh, these were uh, magistrates that were elected annually, I think for one-year terms, that also helped advise the kings. And in a sense, they were kind of almost like de facto rulers that ran the state uh, along with the actual kings. So traditionally, yeah, the Spartan government was that, that's what they had. They had an oligarchy, uh, which uh, was kind of at loggerheads with the Athenians' democracy. Athens didn't really like that form of government, uh, but they had, and that's part of what led to the the different animosity between them, not just because of their different cultures. Uh, Sparta had an army and Athens had more of a naval power uh, in comparison. Uh, now, let me also get to and talk for a few minutes on the Athenians uh, as well. Athens was an Ionian state. I told you that, that went back to uh, you know the Greek Dark Ages when it kind of emerges uh, as an important state. Uh, like I said, it's located on the Attica Peninsula, uh, kind of north or east of Sparta. It's about where it's located. It's more known for its cultural influences, uh, like I told you, democracy, uh, arts and science. I uh, told you about history. Uh, we talked about all those kind of different things that you know the Greeks are kind of known for uh, traditionally, but they're also known for their maritime power. I'll get to it later, but the Athenian Navy uh, is pretty important for a long time, uh, especially around the time of the uh, Greco-Persian Wars. It's part of why they win uh, that conflict is because of naval power uh, in general. And uh, I've talked about it before, but of course the namesake you see of um, Athens is the goddess Athena. Athena, of course, one of the daughters of Zeus. Uh, she's often associated with like wisdom, War, war uh, and um, the olive tree uh, overall. Uh, we'll talk about Athena later and a lot of the different gods, of course, in Greek mythology uh, that are famous. Um, here's kind of, of course, another image showing you, of course, the Greek world where Athens is. Of course, Athens the most populated city, of course, uh, in the Republic of Greece. I think the population of Athens, though, in Attica may have been like 50,000 people at the time or more, uh, which would be like around 5th, 4th century uh, B.C. And it's an area that that's includes like that area of Attica I told you about, uh, where Athens is, of course, today. Yeah, we'll get to Athenian naval power. That is something that they're very famous for. Of course, the Greeks were known for the famous warship called the Trireme, uh, which is a type of uh, a type of Greek warship that was, you know, powered by oars and, of course, uh, use of sails. As you see, that was considered one of the greatest warships at the time uh, when it was built. But let me get into more like politics uh, more than anything about Athens. 
Uh, like I said, uh, Athens is famous for its democracy. I mean, one of the men that first helps to really get that started uh, is Solon the Wise, uh, as they call him. Uh, he's considered to be the father of Athenian, Athenian democracy. He's really one of the first. He really starts, you know, to make, you know, reforms to the Athenian state uh, at that time. Uh, and uh, prior to him, uh, Athens, uh, the, the kind of uh, politicians that they had that ran the state were actually tyrants uh, that they had. And um, they had this one tyrant here I'll kind of share with you. His name was Draco. He lived in the 7th century B.C. And he was known for developing what they call draconian laws, which were very strict uh, against against the people uh capital punishment for all kinds of different things, not just murder, but theft and so on. Uh, and so Solon was one of the first to come along and cancel a lot of these kind of laws out, and he created more democratic laws. I think the only form of capital punishment you could get was really murder, uh, was, was, about, was about it. Uh, what were some things that he did, Solon, to reform the state? Uh, well, uh, he actually changed their whole economy. Uh, one thing that Solon did was he got Athens to specialize in growing olive trees uh, to make olive oil. And so Athens became known for exporting olive oil. That's one of their basic economies that they have. They think it's part of one of the things that will evolve over time uh, to help create the Athenian Empire, uh, exporting different goods uh, to different parts of the Aegean base. He also canceled all debts in the form of serfdom and child slavery. Uh, it was another thing he did because a lot of people would get in debt. And one thing they would do is they would sell their children to get out of debt or something like that or go into serfdom. And he banned that, uh, basically. Uh, oh, the big thing Solon did, too, was he created uh, Athens into different social classes. It was kind of unique about it, uh, which they had like kind of like four social classes they had. And traditionally, they had an upper class, which was comprised of the aristocracy, and then those that were in the cavalry, uh, in the, mili in the you know, Greek militaries, would be part of that, or we call it knight. Uh, then you, the middle class was like the hoplite soldiers, uh, which a lot of them were mostly peasant farmers, uh, traditionally. And then your thets, your thets are more like your lower class. These are like um, landless peasants would be basically the ones on the bottom. They traditionally at that time didn't have a whole lot of political rights though uh, in, in Athens. And most of the power was really in the hands of the upper and middle classes. Uh, let's see, a few other things too. He is also known for creating a lot of their laws and their constitution. That's kind of important there uh, as well. So he's kind of considered Athens' great lawgiver. He's, I think, one of the nicknames they sometimes call him. They create a lot of their laws, uh, a lot of their assemblies, uh, a lot of their traditional courts uh, were also developed by him, which I'll get to it, uh, of course, today a little bit. But uh, a traditional, uh, uh, like a Greek consul, uh, was often called a bulle. A uh, bulle uh, was a type of council of male citizens that ran the affairs uh, of a state. And so that was, they think, traditionally one thing that Solon did uh, was he created one of these main assemblies uh, to run the affairs of the state, which I think they call it sometimes the Council of 400, I think is kind of a modern name uh, that they called it, where 400 representatives uh, would be elected by lot, usually annually, uh, to help run the state. Uh, they had another assembly called the Ecclesia, uh, and then that assembly I think all the uh, male citizens could participate if they wanted to. He also had this other thing he developed too that's famous called the Areopagus, which means in Greek, uh, hill of Ares or rock of Ares. And uh, it was a type of um, Athenian high court of appeal, uh, kind of like a Supreme Court of some type uh, where they would appeal cases. Uh, they dealt with also capital punishment issues and uh, it's kind of been compared sometimes to like our, like the United States Supreme Court or other kinds of Supreme Courts that are kind of out there. And it was called the um, Areopagus because they met near the Acropolis on this 
part of it called the Rock of Aries or the Hill of Aries, and so it got its name from that uh, over time. So, yeah, he's known for a lot of different things, uh, Solon the Wise. He was kind of considered almost like a, like a philosopher uh, as well. Now, the only thing was, though, they had uh, other, I'll kind of get to it, too. They had other politicians that were in Athens as well. Pisistratus uh, was a known I'll kind of talk about, and I'll talk about Cleisthenes uh, as well. They think around 560, uh, tyrants took over the state. Is one thing that happened. Uh, Pisistratus had these two sons named Hipparchus and Hippias, and so for about 50 years, uh, if they think from about 560 to about 510 BC, Athens was controlled by these aristocratic tyrants, uh, which were kind of like dictators, and actually they were popular with the lower classes, like the Thets, kind of liked them, because uh, they kind of gave them more power. Uh, and so for about 50 years, uh, they controlled the state. They kind of suspended some of the laws that Solon had kind of created uh, during that time. Uh, so they kind of wavered back and forth between having a democracy uh, and having a, a tyranny. But uh, over time, what happened was they were kicked out uh, with help from Sparta. Sparta uh, at the time was actually kind of allied with Athens around that period. They helped drive out the tyrants uh, that were controlling Athens. And so in 510 BC, this man named um, Cleisthenes seized power in what was like basically like a political revolution, sometimes dubbed the so-called Athenian Revolution. And um, however, the Spartans had wanted them to create an oligarchy. He didn't want to do that. He wanted to put it in, back in democracy. And so Cleisthenes uh, would go on to you know, restore democracy uh, to Athens. And so Cleisthenes is traditionally known as the father of Athenian democracy also as well uh, in a lot of his things that he did. Uh, those are some things that he did that are kind of famous. Uh, he's known for creating the so-called Council of 500 or Bole of 500, which they think the Council of 500 is considered to be one of the first major it's considered one of the first major uh, democratic assemblies in history because of the way uh, the actual representation was broken up. And uh, what he did was he broke up all of Athens, uh, I guess Attica, uh, into uh, basically uh, 10, 10, what they call 10 demi, or 10, 10 tribes, I guess. Uh, and each tribe could send 50 members to this council, uh, equal to 500 he also gave them term limits. So it looks like they were limited to like two annual terms, basically, is what they could do. And they are all elected by lot, of course, is how they were chosen uh, to be elected to this council. Uh, also, another thing he's famous for, besides the um, Council of 500, he also established what they call ostracism. And every uh, so many years, I guess every year, I think, usually annually, I think is what it was, they would choose to kick somebody out, but they don't want to be, I guess, in their tribes. And they'd ostracize them. And if you get the most votes, you had to leave for like 10 years and you couldn't come back. I think that's what happened to Socrates. Uh, he was ostracized, but he chose death instead, is what occurred. So that's kind of Cleisthenes, uh, of course, who he's famous for. Uh, you know, traditionally, they traditionally, you know, what we call it democracy uh, and all that. So I'm going to get to it later. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about this man, too. I didn't really get into it, but I'll, I'll talk about the age of Pericles also. Pericles is a famous politician that emerges uh, in the 5th century B.C. He's probably considered the greatest politician that they have. He was also a general uh, during the Greco-Persian Wars. He's kind of living during that time. Uh, we'll talk about him. He's the one that rebuilds the Acropolis behind me uh, and is famous for constructing the Parthenon uh, today. Uh, we'll talk about that. I'll get into the Greco-Persian Wars next week, too, uh, which is a major event uh, in, in Greek history. Uh, we'll talk about that, too, uh, also as well.